welcome everyone to the second session of the 2021 Global Corporate Governance Colloquium hosted by Yale Law School and co-organized co by ECGI. Our uh, first presenter is uh, Elizabeth Polman, professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and uh, an ECGI research member. Her paper is titled The Corporate Governance Machine and is co-authored with Dorothy Lund, who is also in the audience. Elizabeth, uh, uh, the virtual floor is yours. You have 20 minutes as agreed. Thank you so much. I want to start by uh, thanking a, uh, ECGI and um, Yale Law School as well. We're so glad to be here. And as Luca mentioned, this paper is a work in progress, co-authored with Dorothy Lund from the USC uh, Gould School of Law, who's also here. And it's titled The Corporate Governance Machine. It's about the US system of corporate governance, the historical and intellectual underpinning, who's involved, how it's oriented, and the implications and future paths. And it started out of a conversation that Dorothy and I, Dorothy and I had a couple summers ago uh, about the corporate purpose debate. There was increased attention on the topic, of course, which has continued to rise. And we noticed that it tends to focus on either what business leaders should do to run companies or corporate law and fiduciary duty and discretion. Yet, despite a lot of talk, we see existing patterns are really sticky in the US and the very debate takes place in somewhat predictable ways. And we see this not only with the corporate purpose debate, but with other examples as well. Often when we're talking about a corporate governance reform proposal, we see certain dynamics such as with conflict minerals disclosures or reforms to shareholder proposals, when companies stray from the usual path, like by using dual class stock, et cetera. So Dorothy Lund and I wanted to take a step back and give a meta account of the system of US corporate governance with particular attention to US public companies. And we look to the past, present and future and essentially, we aim to show that in the US, corporate governance is more than a neutral set of procedures and processes. It's a system composed of multiple legal and institutional players. And we provide a descriptive account of the law, institutions, and culture that make up that system. And we show that as the evolution has taken place, what we call the corporate governance machine has developed a strong orientation towards shareholders. And we look at the consequences of the machine's workings and suggest that it's potentially suboptimal in certain ways. When shareholderism is locked into rules and norms and power structures, and that gets imposed across companies uh, through best practices, that can impact corporate governance innovation and diversity. And we show how soft law and legal reform gets filtered through the shareholder system. So for example, even moves to incorporating stakeholder interests is happening through that system that gives shareholders primacy. And we conclude with some uh, observations about likely futures uh, for the US uh, system of corporate governance. So that's just a brief overview. The paper is divided into these four parts. And I'll briefly highlight just a, a few points about each. So starting with the past, um, part one of the paper traces the rise of the term corporate governance alongside the rise of shareholder primacy. And the term corporate governance was initially coined in the 1960s by a business ethicist named Richard Eels, who was arguing for a quote, well-tempered corporation that would serve public values. He called for a quote, a theory of corporate governance consistent with the ideals of democratic society. And then the term appeared in the New York Times about a decade later in 1972, and in the midst of a series of corporate scandals. And during that period of the 1970s with hundreds of public companies in the newspapers for corporate misconduct, for different reasons, both the political left and right embraced that term. And its usage initially reflected an analogy of controlling managerial power through internal government-like checks and balances. Ralph Nader, for example, argued that private governments of the mega corporations should be more democratic, responsive to the public, and around that time, we also, of course, saw Melvin Eisenberg introduce the concept of the monitoring board. Jensen and Meckling injected the economic concept of agency costs into a debate about corporations. The divergence of interest between the shareholders and corporate managers became agency costs to be minimized, and those voices started to prevail. And then quickly by the 1980s, a normative overlay of what constitutes good corporate governance emerged serving shareholder interests to minimize agency costs and maximize shareholder value or wealth. 
The deal decade of the 1980s locked that meaning in and propelled it. So by the end of the 1980s, shareholder wealth maximization had moved into the corporate governance mainstream, influencing corporate boards and management. And then critical perspectives received other labels like progressive corporate law or stakeholderism. So in sum, while the term corporate governance had initially been used to invoke the notion of a well-tempered corporation consistent with the ideals of a democratic society and was embraced in the 1970s by those giant corporation in the public interest, by the 1980s, the term was predominantly used in the context of discourse on reducing agency costs to serve shareholder interests and to maximize shareholder wealth or value. So shifting to the present, um, that intellectual legacy lies at the foundation of our contemporary system, the corporate governance machine. And in part two of the paper, we describe three reinforcing components, law, institutions, and culture. And because this part will be uh, likely familiar to this audience, I'm just going to highlight a couple points. On law, we describe Delaware, Congress, the SEC, and the Department of Labor. For institutions, what we're discussing is players in the market for corporate governance. Many of these have rules or voting policies where they play an important role in furthering those or advocacy, um, such as you see here, stock exchanges, influential investors, indices, proxy advisors, rating agencies, investor associations, industry associations. And um, we start uh, the paper uh, by putting emphasis on influential investors, such as large mutual funds, um, hedge funds and pension funds, and we particularly emphasize that rise of large institutional investors. And uh, on to culture, in some ways we think culture is one of the more interesting uh, components uh, and the most difficult to pin down in some ways. It can be created and transmitted through a wide array of actors or institutions. Uh, we chose, chose to focus on just three um, to, to highlight that role of culture, professional education, media, and politics. And we show how each of these components further reinforces a shareholder primacy viewpoint. In professional education, we note the particular influence, for example, of business uh, and law schools in shaping how corporate fiduciaries perceive their roles and the corporate objective. And researchers have pinpointed uh, this shift starting in the 1970s with a generation of business school students uh, that became enamored with Milton Friedman's uh, philosophy and changing views amongst uh, many on faculties. And within a decade, business schools had turned towards shareholder capitalism. And studies show that when students enter business school, they tend to believe that the purpose of a corporation is to produce goods and services for the benefit of society. But by the time they graduate, they're more likely to believe that the purpose is to maximize shareholder value. And those graduates in business and law, of course, go on to run and advise US public corporations from the top leadership position down to the newest hire. Regarding the media, we highlight how the language of shareholder privacy gave the business press an easily accessible frame to weigh in on company management and performance and how it has often adopted that language or lens. And politics, we think, is particularly interesting. Shareholder primacy has traditionally had its roots in right of center thinking, whereas stakeholder models have been um, embraced by politicians on the left. But nonetheless, uh, both have furthered shareholder primacy in the US over the past two decades. Pension funds began to use their governance power to advance their political interests, uh, which encouraged left of center politicians to embrace the expansion of shareholder rights. And that trend solidified after Enron and the financial crisis, which sparked criticism of ineffectual monitoring mechanisms, a lack of accountability to shareholder interests, and that induced bipartisan support in favoring strengthening shareholder voice. And the shift from defined benefit to um, uh, defined contribution retirement plans made millions of Americans, working people, uh, investors in the stock market. And so shareholder value creation became uh, perceived politically also as affecting millions of Americans who are investors through their 401k accounts, et cetera. So in sum, this part two, we're setting up the law and institutions and culture that form our corporate governance system in the US and how they orient towards shareholders. But in concluding this part, we point out that of all of the uh, components, culture appears to be the most in flux. Um, and we question, though, whether cultural change by itself could manifest a shift away from shareholder primacy and whether other elements of the corporate governance machine would, would eventually catch on. So let's talk about how it works. 
Um, Dorothy and I thought it was really important um, in writing this paper to not only set out the components and describe how they're oriented towards shareholders, but to, to show their dynamic interaction, how law, institutions, and culture interact to shape US public company governance. So in part three of the paper, we give three examples. And the first example is about how public company boards shifted from mid 20th century managerialism to a monitoring model that started in academia in the 1970s uh, with ideas that view that the chief function of the board is to monitor management for the benefit of the shareholders. That was then endorsed by the American Law Institute in the principles of corporate governance, then embraced by the SEC and the ABA uh, Committee on Corporate Laws. Then the hostile takeover wave of the 80s and the law from that time further solidified the development. And then after Enron and WorldCom, the New York Stock Exchange convened a corporate governance task that generated strict uh, director independence requirements. Congress adopted the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. Proxy advisors incorporated those ideas into voting guidelines. So these legal and extra legal changes led to this dramatic shift in board composition from the mid um, 1950s to uh, mid 2000s, the percentage of independent directors on large US public company boards increased from approximately 20% to 75%, despite the fact that there isn't conclusive evidence that director independence leads to better decision-making and oversight or even performance. Um, and that shows the interaction of the components, how ideas starting in academia, can be furthered by legal agencies and major institutions and market players adopting rules that bring something into the mainstream. Our second example is the evolution of CSR to ESG. And in the 1950s, CSR was framed in moral terms about social welfare. Corporations had the obligation to engage in social responsibility because it was the right thing to do, advocates would say. But we uh, pinpoint that by the 1980s, a shift was beginning to take place. The agency cost and shareholder privacy view of corporate governance was taking over and researchers of CSR began to study the link between the responsibility of corporations and financial performance and to make a business case for CSR. And that accelerated by the 2000s when uh, it was recast as uh, ESG, risk adjusted value oriented environmental social governance concerns at a UN conference that brought together institutional investors, financial analysts, consultants, and regulators. And that reframing enabled ESG to hit the mainstream. It was consistent with Delaware law, so legal actors and scholars could embrace it. CSR advocates might have been willing to accept it, um, as previous efforts had um, made limited inroads. And not only that, as investors started to accept this idea that integrating ESG could mitigate risk and create shareholder value over the long term, Market players started to realize they could supply metrics and other services for a fee, um, and ESG became a business opportunity itself. And that example shows how the corporate governance machine can take a concept unlinked from shareholders and through law markets and culture, reshape it, and in doing so, allow it to thrive in this system. Our third example is about benefit corporations, that the idea that now, to the extent a business wants to pursue profits and a social purpose inconsistent with shareholder wealth maximization, the customized option is now in a completely different form of corporation, the benefit corporation. And Dorothy and I point out that even this form of business corporation, the one that is pushed out of the traditional form, is still subject to the forces of shareholder power. So finally, um, the last part of the paper on implications and the future. So we have a sense of the history and the components and dynamics of our US system. So in this last part, we, we step back and ask, well, what are the implications of the system that's developed? And what can we say about the likely future of a US public company governance? And we make a few points. Here, we observe that it, this system is shaping the future path. It's shaping corporate regulation. Um, the very manner of advocating for legal reform is being affected by this. So for example, in the US, with the current debate about ESG disclosures, even advocates in favor of ESG disclosures are focusing on information that would be material to investors and framing their arguments in that way. And a similar pattern emerges um, in practice and in soft law um, norms. So for example, as voluntary ESG disclosure standards have, have been um, increasingly adopted, in the US, we see the flexible shareholder orient, 
oriented SASB standards winning out, despite the fact that the uh, more stakeholder oriented GRI standards are popular elsewhere and have existed longer. The fact that legal reformers work within this language and conceptual framing uh, solidifies our cultural understanding that corporations exist for the benefit of shareholders. So to the extent that this is shaping it, there's also a reinforcing uh, mechanism. And when that um, legal reform increases shareholder power, that furthers that effect. It locks into the corporate governance machine's orientation, more shareholder voice and more ideas towards that end and the players who perpetuate that dynamic. We also think our system uh, pushes towards one size fits all governance and might be hampering innovation in corporate governance. And that's despite any consensus about universal good governance practices. We see this, um, this push across many different types of companies, annual director elections, independent boards with the board chair and the CEO, majority voting, no poison pill, pushback against dual class, et cetera. So ultimately, we think this deserves additional study, and we know many scholars are working on this. Um, in this paper, we observe that to the extent that the operation of the US corporate governance machine is dictating a governance blueprint in some form for vastly different firms, that that, that may be suboptimal, even for those who embrace shareholder value maximization as an objective. It's also influencing the public-private divide here. We see a greater diversity of governance arrangements in the private company context. Private companies regularly depart from the governance machine's precepts. Many private companies have unequal voting rights, founder-dominated boards, and other bad governance characteristics. Those uh, governance arrangements have been tolerated or accepted, even uh, viewed sometimes as necessary to protect high growth innovative companies with visionary founders or companies that wish to stay true to some kind of mission. But that changes once a company goes public and everybody understands that. Companies will become subject to heightened scrutiny from institutional investors, ratings agencies, investor advocacy groups, stock exchanges, stock indices, proxy advisors, the machine part two, and the various pressures and preferences that come with it. And in an environment with significant private capital available, that may be contributing to the trend of companies staying private longer. Startups that have visionary leaders and market leverage have pushed for dual class or multi-class structures to insulate themselves from this. And in doing so, that's been one of the few sources of governance variation injected into public markets. We also highlight that the governance machine might be affecting the balance of what sorts of activities are also being done by public or private firms, um, for example, research and development. And then finally, on the future paths, um, as the shareholder orientation has become enmeshed in our legal, institutional, and cultural understanding of good governance, and as multiple powerful players operate as gatekeepers, uh, Dorothy and I observe that it's become difficult to move to another paradigm, one that gives power to other stakeholders or allows corporate executives to make decisions based on the corporate entity or overall social value or welfare or something else. And we think that without a substantial shock to the system in the US, like a major federal intervention, um, we think stakeholder is unlikely to dethrone shareholder primacy as the dominant framework. Instead, the corporate governance machine forces stakeholder advocates to fit their models into the existing infrastructure. And that can, that can result in meaningful change. And that's already underway. As shifts in understanding occur, um, there could be more and more of this um, regarding the merits of various ESG initiatives, better metrics for uh, measuring those benefits, greater level of stakeholder interests could be reconciled with pursuing long-term shareholder value. Uh, and that can create business opportunities for the various institutional players that may embrace this and, and continue to do so. We think that in turn shapes the type of ESG activities that companies will choose to engage in. And over time, we might also see that corporate ESG activities will tend to take a one size fits all form too. So I'll stop there and we very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. So now it's um, for uh, Professor Gaiska Ormaz. Zabal, Associate Professor at uh, IESE Business School and ECGI Research Member to take the floor for um, the discussion. So thank you, thank you very much um, um, for the organizers, uh, Luke and, um, and Elisa, you know, to, to give me the opportunity 
to discuss this this paper. I am not a, a legal scholar, so I mean, I, discussing a paper like, uh, like this for me is, is like a new experience. Okay, so that being said, let's see. Okay, so uh, this is the paper in a in a nutshell. Okay, so the idea uh, here is that there is a there is a set of, of institutional components classified in, in three groups: law, institutions, and, and culture. That um, it's called the authors call it the corporate governance machine that reinforces the, the paradigm of shareholder uh, primacy in contrast to, let's say, other paradigms that we could call managerialism or stakeholderism. Okay. So uh, in practice, this uh, would have induced an evolution of the corporate governance system. Uh, it would have induced regulation, uh, one size fits all kind of approaches, uh, less innovation, uh, widen the public private debate, uh, the authors also illustrate the, the workings of the machine uh, with three examples. I mean, a, a raise in, in board independence, the use of ESG to increase shareholder value, uh, the evolution of, of the, the, the Benefit cor Corporation. All right, so I mean, I'm not going to get into, let's say, the historical evolution of all this because I don't know enough. Um, but as I am persist, um, I mean, the, I guess the first thing that came to, to mind is to which extent this, this narrative is is supported by, by the data. And in particular, whether there, there has been a significant evolution in the corporate governance system that justifies uh, this, this study. Okay, so um, let me show you some, some data about the things that the, the paper talks about. Uh, board independence, I, I guess that this is well known. Right? I mean, this is SOX, listing requirements and, and so on. But the, the magnitude is, is, is kind of um, remarkable. Okay. Uh, on the public-private divide, um, I, I guess this is also well known. Uh, it's been studied by the literature. Um, there is fewer and fewer uh, public firms in the in the U.S., and this doesn't seem to be happening around the world, All right? So, in, on institutions and in particular influential investors, again, uh, we we know that uh, the, the the holdings of, of large asset management firms are, are increasing, but I guess I mean the interest of showing this this evidence is. It's not to show something that we qualitatively don't know, it's just to be aware of the magnitude of the, the speed of the change that we are witnessing. All right, so now let me show you something that perhaps is less uh, well known. Uh, this is from a paper I'm currently working with a couple of co-authors. So um, we focus on uh, CEO pay dispersion, uh, defined as the standard deviation of CEO pay uh, divided by the mean uh, of, of CEO pay in the, in the economy or in the, in the industry. Okay, so this is what we find. It's a, a, a dramatic uh, decrease. Uh, we, we find or we provide evidence that this decrease is driven by an increase in the practice of benchmarking against firms in the same industry and, and size group. Okay, so basically reciprocal benchmarking, I mean, including each other in, in, in the compensation peer groups would lead to a convergence of uh, compensation in, uh, within industry groups. Okay, so we also find that this is driven by proxy advisors recommendations, institutional investors, SOP. So exactly the, the parts of the machine that Dorothy and Elizabeth uh, described, okay? So, I mean, this is sort of like in support of the notion that there is more and more one size fits all out there. All right, so what about the effect on uh, stakeholders? I mean, uh, measuring uh, effects on stakeholders is always tricky, right? So this is from a, a recent paper uh, published at uh, QJE, okay? so. The paper documents an, an, an increase in the average markup of, of US firms over time, and uh, which suggests uh, uh, also an increase in market power, right? So I guess we should, we should think about what, what this means uh, for, for consumer wealth. What about employees? Um, a recent, another recent paper by Stensbury and Summers, they uh, provide evidence that there is less and less union membership and there is less and less uh, variance uh, of industry wage differentials which is uh, supposed to be um, associated with rent sharing with, with labor, okay? So, I mean, of course it's descriptive, they do other things in the, in the paper, but it's, it's kind of suggestive that there has been a, a decrease in workers bargaining power over, over the last decade, all right? What about the environment? Um, I guess that this is, this is not new for you, uh, but based on recent studies, uh, it looks like the current environmental efforts are not enough to get to the net zero emissions by, by 2050, okay? So the, the, 
the temperature might, might increase more than two degrees and this, this could have important consequences. So in, in some, my, my takeaway is that overall, uh, it looks like there is some evidence consistent with the narrative of the, of the paper. Uh, regardless of what you might think about, let's say the underlying factors uh, of these patterns that they show, I think that these patterns are, are remarkable and, and, and suggest that we are witnessing important changes that we need to, to understand. I think that a paper like this can, can help us in this regard, all right? So that said, I, I, I do have some, some questions about the, the machine. And here's, here's my first question. Uh, does the machine end up increasing uh, shareholder wealth? I mean, one would expect that if the machine uh, sort of like reinforces the, the, the shareholder primacy paradigm. I mean, it, it should end up sort of like increasing uh, shareholder wealth. I mean, if, if you go over the literature on, let's say the specific things that the, let's say the components of the actors involved in this machine are, are doing, this is not that clear. Really. So, uh, you know, there, there are some examples of it. This is not supposed to be, let's say a comprehensive review of the literature. I just picked some, some papers uh, from, uh, let's say the, the the finance, uh, accounting, econ literature. Okay, so I mean, there are some some examples like uh, disclosure regulation, SOCs, SOP, uh, proxy access, uh, proxy advisors recommendations, credit rating agencies. We could talk about other components of the machine, stock exchanges, stock indexes, media, politics. I mean, my, my takeaway from reading this literature is that uh, it looks like sometimes these people do things that are, if not, uh, let's say negative, at least uh, non-positive uh, things on, on, on shareholder value. Okay. So another question is uh, whether there is uh, there are missing parts in, 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 in the machine. So, I mean, is the, is the paper missing some parts of the machine? I mean, why, why these components of the machine and, and, and not others? Uh, what could come up with uh, other potential components of the machine? For example, the standard setters, I mean, they're, they, they, they have pushed really hard for value accounting, which focused on, uh, is focused on investors, not on other potential users of accounting information. Uh, auditors uh, also focus on financial materiality. Analysts uh, are focused on, pretty much focused on shareholder value. And we could talk about others like maybe investment bankers, security attorneys. So, I mean, it, it looks like the paper at some point draws a line and say, well, here, here, here are the components. Uh, but, but there could be others. I, I don't know whether you know this sort of like selection has been done based on what they think is are the most important ones, but this is not discussed in the paper. And, and I think it might be worth uh, um, you know, commenting on it. Uh, have countervailing forces become weaker? I mean, if the machine uh, is getting stronger, one would expect these countervailing forces you know, to become weaker. Again, this is not a comprehensive list. Um, but I mean, if you go over the, the, the list, I mean, you will, uh, I guess you will reach the conclusion that it's not totally clear. I mean, let's pick the, the, the first one, employees. Uh, yes, I mean, this decline, maybe there's declining worker power. Um, the employees have, be, have become shareholders, but there's an increasing number of, of employees or potential employees that care about ESG. We're gonna discuss a paper about it tomorrow. So, and you could reach a similar conclusion uh, looking at other, let's say, countervailing forces of the of the machine i mean like you you would reach the conclusion that is is not it's not totally clear that this these forces have become weaker all right so another question how how did the machine react to covid um i guess covid is in a way i mean it's is is like an experiment i mean it's like an exogenous shock so uh, i guess it's sort of interesting to see uh, how the machine kind of reacted to it. Okay, so let me show you some, some data. Uh, executive compensation went up, went up in 2020. I mean, uh, at least uh, I was not uh, aware of this uh, until I started sort of like uh, thinking about the paper and, and looking for information related to it. Um, but there, 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 there's lower SOP support. I mean, so far, uh, at least 12 uh, propositions have been uh, voted down. I mean, th this is way more than in other years, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, it looks like the machine is kind of reacting somehow. Uh, so virtual shareholder meetings, I mean, uh, many shareholder meetings have gone online and there's a, there's a recent paper that analyzes that. And uh, the paper finds that a number of questions uh, were ignored and a number of topics were, were avoided. Care for employees, uh, especially interesting, I would say, in COVID times, right? What did signatories of the business roundtable statement do? 
All right, so here's some evidence. Okay, so it looks like they, they did more than other firms, but uh, not all of them. Okay, so I mean, take away from this. Well, maybe managerialism is not quite dead. Um, maybe, you know, this paradigm of, of, of shareholder, uh, let's say primacy is not 100% implemented. And maybe stakeholderism is, is not complete window dressing because at least, I mean, it looks like these BRT firms are doing, are doing something uh, along those lines. All right, so a second experiment, so to speak, to, um, to test the machine in current times. Uh, is the machine affecting the debate on sustainability reporting? This is a very important debate, as you know. I mean, uh, we in the in accounting area are very, very um, active on it. Uh, here are the key points of the, of the debate. Uh, what information should firms be required to disclose? How to enforce the sustainability reporting standards? How to avoid unintended consequences? These are very hard questions. But the, the tricky thing of this debate is that the goal itself of uh, sustainability reporting, it's, I mean, there's no consensus about it. Uh, one view is that we should give investors what they want, uh, but another view is that, uh, you know, this reporting should drive change, okay? So, I mean, if we give investors what they want, uh, we should go for what we call single materiality, which is basically disclosing uh, things that are, let's say, relevant only for financial performance. Uh, but if we're going to drive change, we may going to go for double materiality, which would be also to, you know, to force disclosure of things that are uh, relevant for the environment or society. So what is the, which of the two approaches uh, has been adopted by standard setters? I mean, look at, this is, this is from the consultation paper just um, put out by the IFRS Foundation. I mean, it looks like they are taking the first approach. Uh, you could uh, interpret this as, what well, you know, here, here's the machine again, okay? But I mean, if you keep reading their reasoning, um, you would see that, I mean, they, they, they wanna go for double materiality. Actually, they say, well, you know, we are taking this single materiality approach for the moment. We are focusing on, on, on investors, but uh, and this is gonna be gradual and, and, and eventually we, we will get there. Well, we will see, and one, one could argue whether, you know, they gotta get there like, uh, you know, uh, quickly enough uh, to, to uh, let's say, counteract all these, these uh, environmental challenges that we have um, nowadays. But anyway, so now just uh, to finish, um, the paper also talks about the future. Okay, so, and I would say that the paper is not particularly positive uh, about the, the, the future, even though uh, there is a, we observe a spectacular increase in, in, in in uh, sustainability uh, investment, okay? So uh, the paper uh, argues that the machine is gonna end up mitigating this effect because it's gonna be greenwashing, check the box kind of approach. Firms will introduce some sort of like value maximization constraint in, the, in their ESG actions. And maybe, uh, you know, there are grounds to be concerned. Um, indeed, I mean, there's some anecdotal evidence supporting this concern, okay? So, I mean, for example, I mean, as you can see there, like BlackRock has been accused of being inconsistent with, with Larry Frank's uh, public statements about, uh, about ESG. But I think that there's also room for hope. I mean, uh, there, is, there is recent evidence that shows that the big three uh, have started to push firms to decrease uh, CO2 emissions. This is from a paper I just published with, uh, with some colleagues. And, uh, you know, we, we find that, I mean, in the past, there was no association between big three holdings and, and CO2 emissions, but uh, lately it looks like, I mean, there's something there. And we provide additional evidence in the paper based on engagements that um, looks like, I mean, something is going on. I mean, there's some sort of like effect. Uh, well, whether this effect is big enough, uh, we can't tell. Okay? And also uh, we are starting to observe things like this one. Um, he's an environmental activist, uh, investor that wins two seats at Exxon's board uh, with only 0.2% of, of shares. Okay, so I guess this would be unthinkable a few years ago. Uh, interestingly, the, the stock price reaction was negative, which is inconsistent with, with shareholder value maximization. And just to finish three, three more points, okay, and I, I will finish with this. Uh, first, I wonder whether uh, there is anyone behind the machine. I mean, if the parts are not coordinated, uh, perhaps the machine is, is, is not uh, as strong or as powerful as, as the paper claims. Okay? Uh, the, the second point I would make is that the machine is, is different outside the US. I mean, there are different laws, institutions, culture. Uh, perhaps there will be conversions. I mean, one could say, okay, there's gonna be conversions towards the US. Maybe it's, a, it's an empirical question. 
Uh, and lastly, um, I guess, I mean, I kind of wonder whether ESG is becoming a, a social norm a la Benabu and Tiro. Uh, if that is the case, um, maybe we should expect a strong effect on individual behavior, regulation, uh, investment, and, and this might have implications for the debate on, on, on a stakeholderism. Uh, can this uh, turn the machine into a body or an ecosystem to use, a, let's say, a more positive language? Uh, I don't know, but um, I do know that whoever reads uh, this paper is going to think hard about it, uh, which is in and of itself important. Okay, so this is all, all I have to say. Uh, again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to discuss this very interesting paper. Many thanks, uh, guys. We now have uh, uh, approximately 25 minutes for, for a Q&A. So I uh, would uh, start uh, by giving the floor to Jeff Gordon. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> um, it's great to have a chance to, to see everyone, um, even if in this form and not in person. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the question for me is, is um, over the period that um, Elizabeth and D Dorothy described, um, the basic legal setup has remained the same. Um, so what's changed? And uh, what's explained the focus on the shareholders, quote, quote unquote? Um, in other words, what's the, I don't know, um, the, the petrol of the machine? Um, and, and so I think uh, the, the first thing to consider is the change in the nature of ownership. Um, if the shareholders are dispersed, uh, the shareholder voice is muted, um, there isn't much share shareholder energy in the machine. Um, but as we've seen, there's been reconcentration of ownership um, and thus potentiation of shareholder voice in many different ways. Uh, doesn't that explain um, much if not almost all of the change. Um, after all, it was the institutional investors who led the way to linking CEO compensation to, to the shareholder value, which is the key transmission link between the change in ownership structure to the change in firm behavior. But that is, again, fundamentally because of the change in the nature of ownership. Conditional on ownership now being what it is, um, uh, um, the notion that we're going to move, that these the shareholders now having discovered their voice um, are gonna move away from that. Um, well, that is the challenge, right? Um, and so, um, it's, it's really the shareholders now against a prior legal regime that really hasn't changed much. It's, it's the nature of ownership that's changed. And doesn't that explain um, almost all of the story? Question Thank mark. you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, please. Um, well, first, I, I want to thank uh, Geiska for what an amazing set of comments that was, and I thank you, Jeff, for um, another excellent comment. I don't know if I should take any time to address the first set of comments or jump into this um, excellent one, so maybe I'll first start by addressing Jeff, and then if there's time, I'd, I'd love to have a chance to also say a few things about um, that amazing set of uh, uh, comments that preceded it. So to Jeff's great question, um, isn't it a lot explained by the change in the nature of ownership? I think Dorothy and I agree that I think that's, that we think that's a very significant part of what has changed. Um, and it explains a lot. Um, at the same time, we think there's value in describing the three components and seeing that as an important aspect of one of those components, because the law itself was part of what facilitated that change to the rise in the increase of um, concentration of, of share ownership through institutional investors. And uh, the ideas still have to be created about what do shareholders do then once they're in that position? What should, be, what should they be doing with any power that they're given? Um, and so you would still ultimately need academics, culture, a, a source of those ideas, law that facilitates that, et cetera. So we think that 
your point is um, excellent, Jeff, and it's a very important part of it. Uh, but we still think there's a value in describing the three components um, because they furthered that and facilitated um, facilitated the role that now these institutional investors play and orients them towards thinking about what they should do with that power. Um, yeah, so sh Luca, should I take some time to address the yes. previous set of comments too? Yeah, Absolutely. great. Um, yeah, so there's so much there and I'd love to congratulate um, Kaiska too on the many excellent papers that he's been involved in recently. And we're so glad you brought those um, to our attention and um, appreciate uh, the effort to pull data and also to ask great questions. So on the questions front, does this increase shareholder wealth? We don't um, necessarily think we can answer that question definitively in a paper like this, but I don't think it necessarily does is what we point out. Um, and not only does this system not necessarily increase shareholder wealth, more importantly, perhaps the bigger question is, um, not only about shareholder wealth, but is it increasing social welfare, which is what the very theory of shareholder wealth maximization was supposed to do, giving power to the residual claimant in a sense to maximize for their interest would ultimately equate with maximizing not only shareholder wealth, but social welfare. And we also don't think that this is necessarily maximizing social, social welfare. Um, and about missing parts, um, we have tough choices to make in writing a paper like this. Um, that you know fits into a law review article format, and we could do more to express how we're making some of those choices. Um, accounting gets addressed, I think, mostly through footnotes, <laughs> um, which you might have noticed, and could perhaps be brought a bit more into the main text. Um, and bankers, of course, um, in some sense, they're included in the sense of institutions in, in part two, um, uh, but uh, they're certainly part of the system, and we don't we don't claim to give a uh, ex exclusive or fully exhaustive um, account, but we try to, to set out what we think are some of the most important players. And to Jeff Gordon's point, for example, we would give more focus, for example, on institutional investors because we think that's a driving force in what's been happening. Have countervailing forces become weaker? It's not totally clear. I, I would agree, and I think th those are interesting questions that um, can be engaged in, in further projects. Though, if we go back to Galbraith's original kind of framing of countervailing forces, we do see um, in other scholarship pointing out, you know, the weakening of antitrust enforcement, declining force of unions, etc. And so it would seem, based on other research, that using the countervailing forces term as it had been originally used, many of the forces that had been present in the mid 20th century have weakened. Um, and how did the machine react to COVID? Um, and executive compensation going up, I think, is, is not a surprise um, to Dorothy and I, uh, based on what uh, we say in the paper. Um, nor, though, is the increased attention to stakeholder interests. We, we also don't think that's necessarily window dressing. We believe that that um, is being incorporated through ESG and ultimately is still being framed, in a sense, as serving shareholder interests. Um, and that goes to the, the, the bigger questions too about the future of shareholderism and the other example um, that, that you asked about, about the debate on sustainability and reporting. In the US, we're having that debate right now about ESG disclosures and the, the SEC specifically asked for public comments on the question of what investors want on this. So we do start to see that first framing um, but ultimately, the future of shareholderism, we think it really depends. It will matter whether we get a, a strong or a weak form of ESG being incorporated through our shareholder system in the US. Because if we get a, a strong or hard form of ESG, that can really start to shape institutions and, and that can look different than what we have today or what we had 10 years ago. Our point is simply that that will be happening through a system that is orienting towards shareholders. And that likely means that certain types of ESG activity is more likely to get incorporated and it will leave out certain types of activity or values that we might also care about. Oh, I wanna say one more thing too about the last question about convergence. Um, uh, we appreciate that the US is different in many ways. And that's part of why we wanted to set out this account because um, uh, 
uh, we, we think the US has particular institutions and culture, et cetera, that is furthering this. At the same time, we recognize that the ESG movement itself has come from outside of the US. And I'd like to highlight Mariana Pargender's great work on international corporate law and uh, telling part of that story of how ESG came about. And it's an interesting example in some sense of how international forces can affect the, the US corporate governance machine, uh, but it still gets filtered through our US system. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so, so now I would give the floor to David Weber, who had a question in the Q&A, but it's better if he, if he um, poses the question himself, uh, I, I guess based on his prior work with Michal Parzuz and others. Hey, Elizabeth, great presentation as always. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the way I think about your project is, you know, the question of will, will the market change millennials or will millennials change the market? And it seems to me your answer is the market will change millennials. And you might be right. Um, um, uh, the way you tell the story is, well, uh, you know, you recognize the, the, the kind of cultural shift that seems to be going on out there, but still there's the, the machine is in place. And even the way you tell the story, of how people like show up at business school or law school one way and the machine gets a hold of them. And I almost picture them being sort of stamped with shareholder primacy ideology and they're spit out the other end as, as, a, as a maximized returner. And all that may be right. And I, I but I, I guess my own reaction to your, to the paper is just, you know, it, maybe it's a question of, of competing data and, and maybe it's a question of interpreting, interpreting uh, that data. It's all very, very contemporary, but it does seem to me that it's entirely possible that this bottom-up cultural shift that I think we are seeing in millennials and Generation Z folk who seem much more willing to take their politics to work, to their consumption, to, uh, to their investment portfolios, that, you know, the machine, this, this force may, this petrol is, is it, to, to steal Jeffrey's, uh, analogy could, could actually alter the functioning of, of the machine. Um, um, you know, I, I keep thinking about the famous Michael Jordan, you know, Republicans buy sneakers to comment from back in the 90s. And I contrast that with the Delta CEO's recent response to voting changes in Georgia. And imagine if he had come out and say, well, we're not going to say anything about these recent changing, changes to voting laws because Republicans fly coach too. You know, if he had said something like that, I think there would have been enormous backlash. And at some point, yeah, we, you know, even if the rhetoric, I concede the rhetoric remains a rhetoric of shareholder primacy and everybody is still trying to fit, fit, fit that in. But I, I guess the question is, is that, you know, is this the inertia of the machine that still requires everybody to, to mouth the language of shareholder primacy, but what's really going on is much more responsiveness to employees and to consumers and increasing difficulty just separating out. You could say shareholder primacy, but how do we even go on separating out the interests of employees and consumers from shareholders, given that there are these constant feedback effects going on between these categories? Anyway, great project. Yeah, wonderful question. Um, and I see a couple others that kind of relate to that in the Q&A. And um, what, what I think uh, we suggest in part four is that ESG fits in this system. In a sense, this system has embraced it and we see so much of this embrace and these efforts towards trying to figure out how to use ESG in executive compensation plans, how to use diversity metrics in uh, executive compensation plans, how to how to have disclosure so that we can have those things, have some kind of accountability, et cetera. All of that is part of, in a sense, a legacy of the system um, that asks for that to happen through this system and done in this way that proxy advisors can then tell you how to vote on it. And um, uh, ratings uh, uh, services can charge a fee for sorting that out, et cetera. And so that is part of the system. And that's what, it, what I mean in a sense of saying, 
it will matter whether we end up with a, a strong or a weak or a hard or a soft form of ESG integrated into the system, because if we have a really robust version of that, at the end of the day, we might still say that it's towards serving long term shareholder value, but the reality on the ground will be different about whose interests are being taken into account and what the pressure is direct corporations towards um, in their decision making and their activity. Um, so we think that matters. Uh, we're trying to describe that system that is doing that. And we also suggest that we reflect on then what we will end up with because certain choices will be made, made in that way about the types of values that can be integrated um, in that way. And so I think, you know, oftentimes when I hear generations referred to like, you know, millennials and Zs, people often point out the diversity within generations, et cetera. But I agree with you, David, that there's a lot of interest in um, younger investors <laughs> and citizens in um, efforts in this regard. And so I think that suggests we might see a more robust form of that continue. Um, but I don't think it changes our view of the system that's arisen and how hard a paradigm shift is away from that towards really more dramatic kind of stakeholder governance um, that isn't just integrating the interests in through the system we already have. Um, and that reminds me of the, the questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A about the machine term and I'll say that from the very first conversation that Dorothy Lund and I had, um, I, I said machine and I, you know, we reflected on that since then. I think it was initially trying to capture something that we then together have really fleshed out um, in the paper as trying to, to capture the idea that there's different components, there's, there's interacting parts to our system and that it works in a somewhat predictable way. And that's what we're trying to capture with that term. But, but of course, other terms could be used. You could use a more neutral term like system. Um, some people um, think you could better capture, for example, that this machine didn't just come all fully formed. It took place and it, it reflects path dependence. And it may not be a well-designed machine. Um, it happened for various evolutionary path-dependent reasons the way that it did. Um, yeah, that's the term we're using, though, to try to capture the idea of the um, interacting parts and the, the, the workings or the mechanisms. Can I just jump in for, a, for one second? And um, I'll just add uh, one thing in, in response to David's question, uh, which is, you know, I think it's absolutely right that you can see shareholders, consumers, um, employees affecting what is profit maximizing for any given firm to do. And I think this is really where we're, what we've seen ESG turn into, which is what this evolution in our paper talks about. You know, people aren't, aren't out there saying, well, you know, it's really, we really need to look out for employees because um, it's the right thing to do. It's, it's getting traction because people are saying is exactly as David mentioned in his comment in the in the chat, you know, this is going to be a PR disaster for the company if we if we treat employees this way. It's going to really harm shareholder value. So we're seeing this sort of um, growing up of ESG uh, really happening within this this machinery. And you know, we can we can reflect on what that means and whether we like it. You know, there there's a risk that if this steam that David is talking about cools, what will happen, um, you know, if we don't have a more, a different infrastructure, some of this uh, stuff that we think looks, looks good, uh, might go away. Um, and, uh, uh, hi, sorry, my son is giving me a dinosaur. Um, the, the other thing to, to note is that uh, if, uh, the social conscience of, of the company is going to ultimately be externally determined in ways that I think maybe aren't great. So if you look back at the, the success of uh, Me Too, before that, people kind of ignored uh, sexual harassment as a, as a concern for boards of directors. Um, and, and it wasn't until we all of a sudden had this sort of societal shift about this really being a business risk for companies that uh, that we see companies taking it on. So again, when, when the steam dissipates, uh, we might lose some of this good orientation that we're seeing um, in, in directions that I think David and others embrace. Thank you, Dorothy. So I think most of the comments have been taken care of, uh, um, but not um, uh, the one trillion dollar question from Konstantin van Arzen, which is, uh, 
What do you think a paradigm shift away from shareholder primacy and good governance might look like? Is there anything which you see as an adequate alternative? And I think that's a good question because my impression reading the paper is that you, you are sort of uh, reluctant to go into whether the alternative should be a, a, an extreme one, a moderate one. So I'm curious to hear what you think about that. Yeah, well, um, uh, Dorothy and I, uh, we, we don't give an alternative in this paper. Uh, perhaps that's something we could do in the future. I, I reflect that I think that um, shareholder primacy is sticky in part because of its elegance and its propensity to be sticky. <laughs> um, and it has dominated for decades now in, for example, legal, US legal education um, and in boardrooms, et cetera, in a way that we describe. And I think that has in some sense suppressed um, the growth or emergence of other good ideas. And people will often say it takes a model to beat a model. And often stakeholder type models are messy and um, they get easily rejected if somebody can't answer in a satisfying way. Well, how do you decide about competing interests between stakeholders? Well, then if we can't answer that question, then we just immediately go back to shareholder primacy. And so I think that's the pattern that we see. That's what we're describing in this paper. And um, we, we, the scope of this paper is limited to describing the system we have in describing the implications in future path without giving a big alternative. But I think alternative models, they're emerging, they're starting to emerge, I think, with the cultural shift um, that we're starting to see. But um, uh, we might offer one in a future paper, but not a, not yet in this one. Thank you, Elizabeth. I, 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 would... I think yeah. Dorothy might just want to jump in. I saw her, if you don't Sorry. mind. Sorry. <laughs> Quickly, I'll just say, Constantine, there's another way of um, looking at your question that, you know, I think I'm, I'm with Elizabeth that we don't want to get at what the alternative would be, but, you know, how could this uh, paradigm shift happen? I think is it in itself a really interesting question. Uh, and we think in light of the, you know, machinery, this infrastructure that is that has been generated, it, 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 it's not going to happen through the sort of advocacy that we're thinking, seeing, or, you know, we don't think it's going to take some sort of substantial shock to the system that would operate on these multiple institutional players all at once to really, and this is where I think the machinery imagery is helpful because, you know, you can't change a machine by, by pulling out one part, you really need to, to get a different orientation. It's a, it's a whole system that we're that we're working with here to get different outputs. Um, what that would require, maybe a, a federal chartering requirement, asking companies to adopt a stakeholder model that this has been proposed by Senator Warren, something like that. Um, what would generate such a shock is another interesting question. Uh, but again, we think that this, in order to get this paradigm shift, it's gonna take, uh, take something major beyond just advocacy um, is our, our instinct here. Thank you. Perhaps, perhaps there's still time for um, Ron uh, Gilson, who has asked a question in, in the chat. Uh, easy, uh, easy question. Um, um, easy to frame. So uh, uh, the Friedman, uh, the Friedman point gets framed today with uh, in terms of enlightened shareholder value. I suppose we can uh, characterize uh, the business roundtable and Davos as enlightened managerialism. Do we, do we have any particularly careful analytics to think that one alternative is going to end up better than the other? That is, do I, uh, do I think Fink uh, has, a better, has a better take? Uh, and the, it's, it's one thing to identify the different structures, but it's another thing to have predictions about which one will generate more jobs, uh, better income and the like, because we're talking about fiddling with a machine whose performance has the biggest impact on the economies that generate jobs, wealth, taxes and the like. So it's not uh, without, I don't know what the right answer is, but the second half, it's really hard to have the second half without the, the first half without the second half. Yeah, yeah. excellent question as always. Um, Ron, thank you for that. 
Um, I know that we'll continue to think about that one as we do think about future projects. I'll, I'll say that um, you're right to observe that what we're describing is a really rich institutional account, which suggests that it's not easy to predict exactly if you try to change something, then what the net outcome would be, which is what I think you're getting at. Um, and uh, I would imagine, though, that it would be important to take into account another uh, point that we make, which is that often in like the culture of this system, we think of the US stock market as reflecting the same thing as the economy. Often the media portrays it in this way. But when you look at, for example, share ownership in US public corporations, while half of US households own stock mostly indirectly, the real wealth is the really concentrated in the very top percent. So understanding the inequality in the system, I think, would also be an important aspect. Um, not only being careful about drawing um, conclusions about shifting from a, a institutional system that we already have about what the net outcome would be, but also keeping in mind that it's a system in which not everybody participates or not everybody participates equally. And that might give us some insights into, for example, if you um, do more for employees how that might shake out um, in terms of um, uh, actual impact on social welfare in trying to adjust a machine like this. One, one more sentence, uh, another way of framing it, if it's not uh, uh, Friedman versus, uh, versus Davos, it may be Burke versus Schumpeter. And as again, I don't, I, I don't see how um, you get further without addressing, uh, without addressing that tension. Yeah, and um, one more line from me, Ron, is that your crispness in phrasing that also reminds me that we have to think that this is also endogenous and the corporations and the players also have political power in creating the system that they're operating in.